Well, let me add my thanks to those from Sally and Jenny for joining us today. The um, concept of these workshops is that there are a whole bunch of topics that everybody can recognize as fundamentally important, but sort of over the horizon, far enough over the horizon that it's not yet clear how you would put together a really meaningful, high traction kind of research program. And so what we've done in GSEP over the last many years is try and pull together leading thinkers on some of these over -hori the horizon topics and try and figure out what would be the questions that are on the one hand researchable and on the other hand best aligned with figuring out how we're gonna work our way into a, into a critical aspect of, uh, of a key energy related problem. And, and trying to find ways to provide meaningful levels of energy at the same time we're removing CO2 from the atmosphere is one of these key problems. There has been a lot of thought that's gone into carbon dioxide removal on the one hand and low carbon technologies on the other. But for a number of reasons, linking those two technologies is an especially compelling part of the energy system, and that's why we're gathered here today. As Jenny's already said, uh, the basic idea is that we'll look at many individual aspects of the topic and then in a part of the program that I'm most excited about and is likely to be most important for us, at the very end we'll break into a series of groups that'll try and actually uh, compile the ideas into, into meaningful ways forward. I hope it'll be instructive for all of you as you think about research agendas and I'm, I'm sure it'll be helpful for GSEP. What I'd like to do is, is very quickly review a set of six issues that I think sort of uh, build the case for serious thinking and potentially serious investment in the area of carbon negative energy technologies. Uh, these six areas are that we know we're in an era of rapidly increasing emissions during a period when we, by early planning, thought we'd be seeing falling emissions. Um, a new and, and profoundly well-established appreciation of the long life of atmospheric CO2, a recognition that even if we get emissions under control, the oceans aren't going to solve our problem on a meaningful time scale. Uh, a new sense that when we think about risks of climate change, we're, we're really thinking about risks that, that are probably most poignant in the disaster risk space, and it's a, a set of issues that we're only beginning to get our hands around. Uh, the critical issue of ocean acidification is one where we know that were we to uh, offset climate change with solar radiation management, we wouldn't be making a difference. And, and ocean acidification is, is one of these uh, you know, outside the box problems that really forces us to think about climate change in a very uh, rigorous way. It also is clear that if uh, the alternative to removing CO2 from the atmosphere is solar radiation management in the sense of uh, putting reflective particles in the atmosphere. There's a, a wide range of risk and uncertainties that uh, we still understand only incompletely. And then finally, I want to comment on uh, other things we can do with biomass and an appreciation of some of the strengths, but also the limitations of biomass-based energy systems. I think everybody's aware that if you compare the trajectory of CO2 emissions over the last decade or so with um, what the IPCC characterized as a reasonable set of possible scenarios, uh, consistent uh, pictures of what the future might look like, that emissions have grown very, very rapidly. In fact, they've grown rapidly relative to any of the expectations of a decade or so, based primarily on the very rapid economic growth in countries like China and India. Uh, one of the most compelling indications that we're in an era of very rapid emissions growth comes from the way that uh, emissions recovered from the economic downturn in 2009. You can see that if you look at past um, economic declines where we saw emissions either stabilize or, or go down, that when emissions growth recovered, it recovered in a way that was essentially parallel to the time prior to the decline. And in many cases, that was, that was accompanied by a, a continued um, decrease in the carbon intensity of the energy system. Notice that the scale is going from higher carbon per amount of energy to, to, to lower as you go up. But what we saw in the 2009-2010 is a, a sharp decrease in emissions from 2008 to 2009, and then an amazing 
recovery from 2009 to 2010. In fact, I shouldn't call it a recovery, an amazing bounce back from 2009 to 2010, such that the 2010 emissions had returned to the essentially the same line we've seen over the last decade, indicating that there was kind of pent up pressure in the system in order to uh, restore the emissions growth. And frustratingly enough, we didn't see uh, continued progress in the carbon intensity of the energy system. So there's, there's lots of indications that without uh, specific action, we're not going to see uh, rapid pulling away from the growth in emissions that we've seen in recent decades. It, it also is increasingly clear that the Earth system is not good at removing CO2 from the atmosphere, and this has a couple of aspects. Uh, one aspect is the aspect that's related to what we do. Uh, this paper from Steve Davis and all a, a couple of years ago shows how much emissions are, are built into the en energy system as a consequence of, of existing inf energy infrastructure. And what you can see is that if we simply utilize the existing energy infrastructure out until its planned retirement point, we're already looking at CO2 concentrations that are up in the um, 425 to 450 parts per million range, simply as a consequence of the, uh, of the energy that uh, the emissions that are built into the technology that's already existing. The, this sense of um, getting ahead of energy technologies with long-lived infrastructure is a really, really important one. And it's one that we haven't really grappled with in a serious way when we've thought about energy futures. But an even more compelling aspect of the permanence of the CO2 in the atmosphere is, is shown in, in these simulations from Matthews and, and Caldera. And there are a whole bunch of papers that have shown similar results now. If you, um, in climate model world, release a huge pulse of CO2 to the atmosphere, what you see is that that pulse of CO2 decays away as the CO2 is partitioned between the atmosphere and the ocean over centuries. The surprising aspect of all of these papers is that if you look at the temperature signal that results from this CO2 pulse, uh, it doesn't decay away with anything like the same level of completeness that the atmospheric CO2 does. The, the basic reason for this is what's happening is that as the uh, CO2 is gradually removed from the atmosphere by the ocean, uh, the ability of the ocean to gradually remove the excess heat is also going down. And so you see what, at least on the millennial time scale, is essentially permanent warming. What that means is that we, we can't just sit back and say, well, at least in centuries, the problem will take care of itself. Many millennia, the problem will take care of itself. Um, uh, fourth issue that I want to raise, it's really important in our thinking. This is a figure from the latest IPCC report on managing the risks of, risks of climate extremes and disasters for climate change adaptation, is that we increasingly understand climate change as a, as a problem not that's creating a sort of a, a well-behaved future with lots of options for putting systematic strategies in place, but one where we're really uh, pushing on the extremes of the climate system and the, the aspects of society that are, that are most sensitive are the aspects that respond to disaster risks. And that the problem of disaster risks is one where uh, both natural variability and anthropogenic change focus together to change what you can think of as the level of hazard, and that that interacts with a complicated social environment to uh, create disaster risk, and when that's expressed in disasters that have an impact on, on economic assets and human lives. The next aspect that's really important to keep in mind as we think about motivations for carbon negative energy systems is that if we, if we look at non-CO2 based methods for adjusting climate and solar radiation management, we don't do anything about ocean acidification. The, the simulations shown here uh, provide a, a picture of, of why it's worth thinking about ocean acidification. Here's the, uh, the state of the global oceans at a, a CO2 concentration of 280 parts per million, the pre-industrial level. And the, the blue and purple colors here illustrate the uh, aragonite saturation that's, that's optimal for coral formation. As we uh, drift the oceans into the, to the reds and yellows, we, we no longer see, at least in the current ocean, warm water corals. Uh, 
And what you can see is that by the time we're at a CO2 concentration of only 450 parts per million, the blues and purples have essentially disappeared from the world ocean, and all of the space in the ocean has been shifted into these aragonite saturation zones that are no longer in the optimal range for coral reef formation. So we're not very far from CO2 concentrations that are already inconsistent with the maintenance of coral ecosystems in the, in the current oceans. By the time we're at 750 parts per million CO2, uh, we're well removed from the optimal zone for, uh, for coral reef formation. And you know, we tend to think about ocean acidification as a coral reef problem, but, but a vast fraction of the ocean food chains are really grounded in um, organisms with uh, carbonate skeletons as a critical part of their, of their lifestyle. So we're really looking at a, a very broad picture of the health of the global oceans when we look at these pictures of acidification. An additional aspect of the uh, problem that's, that's worth understanding is that you know, we've tended to think about biomass energy, at least in the United States, primarily as a, as a route to getting liquid fuels. But there are a number of challenges with this, that probably the most important of which is that it costs really a lot of energy and a lot of carbon to convert biomass into any kind of liquid fuels. And it, it's clear from uh, relatively simple kinds of calculations that even with generation 2000 technology, that if your goal, for example, is transportation services, and you think about uh, the utilization of biomass in the context of how many kilometers can I drive for a hectare of area, that we were already better for light vehicle transportation uh, using the biomass for combustion to generate electricity, to charge batteries, to drive electric vehicles, than we were making the uh, biomass into liquid fuels and then burning it. That's a consequence not only of the carbon cost of converting the biomass into liquid fuels, but also of the very uh, low efficiencies that are realized in internal combustion engines. The, uh, the economists picked up on this recently in a cartoon where they, where they characterized the, uh, the uh, last decade as one in which we thought about using biomass to power light vehicle transportation. But the next decade is one in which we're going to think about electrification of light uh, vehicles. And here they, uh, they argued that we might be wanting to look at uh, using biomass to, uh, to power uh, the, those vehicles that are difficult to move off of liquid fuels. But I think a, a really important and interesting question that's raised by the material that we're going to talk about today is that in, in purely energetic terms, it's often going to be more attractive to um, utilize a carbon negative emissions strategy to use, uh, if, for example, biomass to generate electricity, uh, capture and store the CO2, and then uh, use remaining fossil resources for those kinds of uh, applications like aircraft transportation that are very difficult to electrify. And how we want to manage these trade-offs and the set of options that are available to us is going to be a really key issue of the, uh, of the material that, that we'll be going through today. And then finally, I want to, I want to close with um, a picture of possible trajectories for future emissions as they've been envisioned by the community that was providing the latest generation of scenarios for the, for the IPCC, and these are the well-known uh, representative concentration pathways. And they span pretty much the, well, we're intended to be the conceivable range of possible futures from now through 2100 in terms of, of CO2 emissions, uh, going from a very high emissions world in this 8.5 scenario to a very low emissions world in this 2.6 scenario. But the, but the critical thing that it's important to recognize is that if we did want to get on a route to low emissions, we would need to be looking at a scenario where here, by the middle of the century, we were transitioning the entire global economy from net positive emissions to net negative emissions. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that, that uh, th this level of scenario, which is down in the um, target range of the one and a half to two degrees of, of total warming, requires economy-wide transitions to net negative emissions by about the middle of the century. And we essentially have no technologies in place now in order to, uh, to even explore these strategies. And so I think this, this figure in itself sort of sets up the challenge. We're, 
um, eons away conceptually from uh, even imagining being on a strategy like this. And we're seeing a, a current global energy system where moves in that direction have been uh, slow to non-existent. And the challenge is really uh, very crisp as, uh, as you look at this. If we want to be able to ask, even in the broadest terms, whether this is a possibility, there's a giant research agenda ahead of us. And I'm really excited to have all of you here today to, uh, to tackle it. I, I hadn't really intended this as a, as a uh, presentation to stimulate discussion, but there's a couple minutes, and if anybody has a question, either about the stuff I've talked about or about the overall flow of the workshop, I'd be happy to take a question now. And Jay? Oh, okay, Greg. Yeah, I just came from an, uh, an algal biofuels conference, and uh, you're saying th uh, <clears throat> that it, it appears to you that uh, conversion of biomass to electricity is more feasible, more reasonable, more rational than trying to make some sort of hydrocarbons fuels out of, out of biomass. Uh, d does algae change that at all, or, or um, is it, or, or were you talking about uh, terrestrial plants, or wh where yeah. does algae figure into that? Jenny, do we have, we don't have an algae talk, right? It's a it's a it's a really interesting set of questions. Uh, plants in general, and algae in particular, are spectacular chemical factories, and I hope that uh, personally, as we look at biomass in the context of global energy, we'll, we'll, we'll think about the extent to which they're wonderful chemical factories and take advantage of that. But if you just want uh, energy in the energy system, uh, I, I find it difficult to think of compelling ways to take advantage of that chemical diversity when we know with such high efficiency how to extract energy with either combustion or pyrolysis. Jay, did you have a question? Yeah, actually it was a comment that was stimulated by uh, one of your uh, slides. and. Uh, you were talking about the use of bioenergy with power generation to get negative emissions, and that, in fact, that could cover your transportation. The other thing that is worth bearing in mind is that once you have the, the CCS with the bioenergy, you open the door to an option of going through your refining sector, and as you up the hydrogen to carbon ratio, pulling off those extra carbons, storing those, putting through what is a, a zero emission fuel to the transportation sector, and with net negative emissions coming through that system. Yeah. And so we'll often see, these, see those in combination, uh, just depending right. on, on technology assumptions and, and, and how it all plays out in terms right. of the well, economics. And, and, and that's a really good point, and what I hope is that we'll have a chance to explore a, a wide range of ideas about pathways to having an energy system that's net negative. And it certainly doesn't uh, have to go through just combusting biomass. It could easily start in the refining process. Okay, um, I should, uh, we'll transition to the next phase.